everybody, a very warm welcome to our event today where we're going to be talking about universal truths in the global food system and drawing on the experience from the National Food Strategy, which has been Britain here in the UK. I'm delighted to be here. We're at the Hackney School of Food, which is located in North East London. And this is a place where it's in the grounds of a school and where children come and learn how to cook. And, in, and the work is being led by Tom, who's our host here today. He's a really stellar food educator working with children in schools all around this area. And just out here, we've got this beautiful kitchen garden. And here we're in the space where the children come to learn. Thank you very much, Tom, for, for having us. Um, just before I introduce Henry, who's going to tell us about the National Food Strategy, I just wanted to give a little bit of advice to you all who've joined and, and a request, please. So it would be really wonderful to see you on camera. Um, that will help us to really get a feel for who's in the room and um, will create a nice atmosphere for the meeting. And we'd really love to hear your questions. Um, we want this to be an opportunity to talk a bit about what we've learnt in the UK and to hear your ideas coming from around the world. We've got many countries who've signed up to, or country, people from different countries signed up to join us today and we're really keen to draw in some of your experience. So please do post your questions in the chat and um, uh, write them in right from the beginning. You don't need to wait until the Q&A session. And if you could put your country before you write your question, that would be even better because it would just help us to think about how we might answer the question in the most relevant way to you. So without further ado, really delighted to be here with Henry. Henry Dimbleby is the um, author of the National Food Strategy here in the UK. I've had been extremely lucky to be working with Henry really over more than three years now on the journey that we've gone on for this National Food Strategy. Henry come, has come to this with a really diverse and interesting background. Um, you've been a chef, a journalist. You've set up something called the Sustainable Restaurant Association, which is a, um, an organization supporting restaurants to become more sustainable in their food offer. You've founded Chefs in Schools, which helped to set up this place here and is supporting children to uh, develop better school food, uh, working with schools and, and caterers and so forth. And uh, you're also non-executive director um, at DEFRA. DEFRA is our government department that works on food and environment. And you're one of the um, executive directors, non-executive directors, which helps to guide the strategic work that DEFRA do. So you've got a really diverse range of experience that you're bringing to this challenge. But I think from a personal perspective, it's been, I think what you've brought to this whole process is a kind of challenge of perceived wisdom, um, a real passion to try and find out what the evidence and what the data tells us about what's going on in the food system and a, a really genuine commitment to try and come up with the arguments that really convince people that we need to change the food system and get it to deliver better outcomes. So Henry, over to you. You're going to tell us a little bit about, about the food strategy, what, what we've done in here in the UK, and then we'll move on to think about its relevance more broadly. Great. Over to you. <clears throat> Thank you. I'd, I'd say that all of those things that I did, I did with people. Almost everything I've done has been a co-founding. And you were very much, from the outset, um, uh, my compatriot, my kind of uh, companion through this process. I thought it would be useful to talk about uh, what we did very briefly, the arguments we made, and how we went about it. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with the UK political process, uh, it was an independent review, which means that you get support from uh, government to produce a review, but you then make recommendations, which the government can then decide uh, whether to take or not to take or uh, how it works. And so how we went about it was very much linked into the fact that you not only need to make the recommendations, but you need to persuade people to take those recommendations. We started off by looking at the food system, uh, as Anna said, looking at all of the evidence uh, there is on the goods and the harms that uh, the food system is doing, focused on the UK, but with a global perspective as well, and kind of came to the view that our food system was both a, uh, a miracle and a disaster. And it's a miracle, if you go on to the, uh, the first slide, uh, you can't think about the food system without thinking about the historical context and the fact that 
for most of the, the developed world, one of the biggest fears after the Second World War was the fear of running out of food to eat. Population of the planet was then 2.5 billion. It was projected to rise to eight, nine billion over the next 50 or so years. And in the past, we had simply dug up our food, dug up more land to produce more food. As the population grew, we dug up more land. But we had done that. There wasn't any more land to dig up. And so people were generally worried about running out of food, as many of you on this, uh, on this uh, call will, will know. And it was thanks to the Green Revolution, um, Norman Borlaug, the development of uh, crops that were shorter stemmed, higher yielding wheat that was risk resistant to wheat rust, combined with pneumonia created using the Harbour Bosch process and new ways of irrigating that meant that we didn't run out of food. It is hard to, uh, to, to say what an incredible success that was. It was one of the great feats of human ingenuity. 30% of the people on the planet today still rely on food that is uh, produced using artificial nitrogen. If you took away fertilizers tomorrow, that you would, that it would lead to mass starvation. It's been a great success. But at the same time, it has caused huge problems. Solving that problem has caused huge problems in, in themselves. And it's hard to, to over-exaggerate how much our food system now dominates the natural environment, the biosphere. Uh, it is by far the biggest cause of biodiversity collapse. It's the biggest cause of aquatic collapse of aquatic life. It's the biggest cause both of the pollution and of scarcity of fresh water. Uh, and with climate, with energy, it is one of the two big causes of climate change. To get a sense of kind of how vast this problem is, if we look at the next side, it shows uh, uh, two blobs. This is in the beginning of the Holocene, which is 12,000 years ago when the, the climate uh, uh, began to become steady enough to allow us to develop agriculture. At that time, there were a few million people uh, with the, the tiny little blue dot on the left, and there were a lot of wild animals. Uh, vastly uh, more than there were people. If you look forward to today, and we look at the biomass on the planet of vertebrates and um, invertebrates, you look at the next slide, what you see here is everything in uh, yellow and red is the food that we grow to feed us, the massively increased 7.8 billion of people. In fact, at any one time, the, the meat that we eat, that growing, weighs twice as much as all the humans. And that tiny brown blob at the bottom there is all of the uh, animals, uh, vertebrates, wild animals, vertebrates and birds um, that live on the planet today, now just dwarfed by the food system and the meat we eat. And in the UK, uh, you can see how this has happened. The next chart shows uh, wheat yields coming, uh, increasing over time, and at the same period since 1970, the number of birds that we have here in the UK halving. The same is true of our natural heathland, our ponds, our ancient woodland, all of which have been reduced by about 90% since the 30s. It's been a massive natural collapse. And it's not just nature that it's hurting, it's also our health. So if we look at the, the next slide, it shows the global burden of disease. And uh, it is now the case that those uh, purple mauve blobs are, is the risk, the years lost to diet-related illness. It's by far the largest cause of avoidable uh, ill health and death, uh, outweighing massively now tobacco and smoking. And to give a sense of how concerning that is here in the UK, the NHS now estimates that by 2035, the cost of treating type 2 diabetes alone will be 1.8 times the cost of treating all cancers. So here it is going to completely overwhelm our healthcare system if we don't manage to get a grip on the health problems that the food system is causing. Now, that is a story that you will know, I imagine most of the people on this call will know pretty well. I think the good news is it is a story that is now accepted by, uh, by almost everyone, actually, politicians of all, all hues. The question is, what do you do about it? And when we talked to the experts, we kind of talked a lot about systems and how you take a systems approach. 
and people had different views on this. The, the first was a group of people who would draw quite complicated uh, diagrams. This is one example on the, on the next slide. It's known as the foresight obesity map, and it was... Oh, sorry. Oh, oh, the, the, this slide, by the way, just shows that those health uh, outcomes are massively skewed towards people uh, in poverty. So the left-hand side of each of these charts is the 10% least affluent people in the UK, and the right-hand side is the most affluent, and each chart shows some form of diet-related disease, and you can see there's a huge skew. So not only is it a huge problem for the environment and health, but it also plays out disproportionately on those who are already struggling in society. So we come onto the systems approach, which is the next slide. And this is a, the kind of map that people will draw. And it is a multifaceted problem. There are, it's very hard to, uh, for example, uh, put, to pull out what, where poverty is causing ill health, Ill health and bad nutrition, when nu nutrition is causing poverty, what the causes of that are. But the problem with this kind of approach is it makes you want to give up. It makes you think, God, it's so complicated. And if you present it to politicians, they go, well, what can I do? How can I act on that? The other form of kind of systems approach that people uh, talked about was in the next slide, which shows, uh, which actually is a fascinating slide for the UK and each of your countries will have versions of this, which shows how the responsibility of food is spread throughout government. And actually there are tensions there. So there'll be tensions in our country of business versus health. There'll be tensions between the farming, the, the, um, the department that I support, farming and trade. And these will not always lead to ideal outcomes, but they're not the central cause of the problems. The central cause of the problems, we identify two feedback loops, two uh, areas where the system wasn't working that was leading to spiraling uh, responses that were leading to the problems that we caused. The first feedback loop we called the invisibility of nature. We drew that from Partha Dasgupta's work, which he did for Treasury. And if you look on the next slide, you can see uh, the invisibility of nature. There it is. This is, again, something that everyone knows, which is all of the systems that we use to measure human progress, whether it's the balance sheets of companies or the way we measure GDP, fail to measure nature. And in fact, Dasgupta points out, not only do we fail to value nature, governments actually subsidize activities that destroy nature, fossil fuel extraction, agriculture, to the tune of $500 billion a year, which does between four and seven trillion dollars of damage to nature. So we're not only not valuing nature, we're giving it a negative cost in economist terms. We're paying people to destroy nature. And the, the precursor of this, actually, if you, if you look at what you need to do in the UK, if you start building the cost of nature in, is that you need to think very differently about how you use your land, because you not only need to produce food, you need to restore biodiversity, and you need to uh, sequester carbon. And we, we did a calculation in the plan, which I'd urge you to go and read, which looked at, could you do all of those things simultaneously? So was it possible to have a food system which produced food at a reasonable price that sequestered carbon and restored biodiversity? And the answer was, yes, it was, because there was a good overlap between those areas of land which produced uh, biodiversity, sequestered carbon, and didn't produce much food. But in order to do it, you had to stop wasting uh, food, not just the food that you waste at farm gate, but you had to stop eating so much meat because that was very wasteful of resource and land. Um, and you had to farm more productively. You had to stop wasting land by farming unproductively. The second feedback mechanism that we identified, and that's on the next slide, um, is the junk food cycle. And this is absolutely critical to the policy response. So what we argued was that uh, the problems of diet-related disease were systemic in that there was a, what's known as a reinforcing feedback loop between the our evolved appetites, which uh, compel us to seek out food that is highly calorie dense. It fills us up less often, less quickly. We eat more. Uh, we put on weight. The food companies responded to this by putting more and more money into developing those products, marketing those products. And you get this kind of reinforcing loop. We, put, we, we eat more, they put more money and we eat more we get sick. And in our country, in the UK, 80% of the products that we eat, uh, which form 50% of our diets, so half our diet is processed food, 80% of that is not deemed 
uh, healthy enough to feed to children. It's a massive problem and you're not going to educate your way out of it and you're not going to uh, exercise your way out of it. So we argued that you need a fiscal mechanism to cut that uh, feedback loop. And what's interesting about this is that all of the companies, it's not just we as a species who are stuck in this loop, it's the companies too. They don't, well, they don't get up every morning thinking, how do I kill the kids? Uh, but if they don't make these products, someone else will take their market share. So for everyone to get out, government needs to intervene. And so we uh, <coughs> created four groups of, um, of actions uh, against a set of targets. And the targets are shown on the next slide. So any good food system of the future, you'll have to increase... Uh, and this is based on UK and our calculations in the UK, increase the, the vegetables by about 30%, increase highly fibrous foods by about 50%, decrease processed foods by about 25% and reduce the amount of meat we eat by 30%. And in order to do that, on the next slide, uh, we have four categories of actions. And I'm not going to go into all of these today. Suffice it to say that you have to do things that break that junk food cycle. And in particular, we recommended a tax a sugar and salt tax to help cut that commercial incentive. You have to support the diets of the least affluent. So we made strong arguments for benefits in kinds, for subsidizing the, the production of vegetables to various people who are less, uh, sorry, the consumption of vegetables to various people who are less affluent in society. You have to have agricultural incentives to ensure you use your land better. And then you have to change the food culture. So you almost have to make two transitions. One is to make the bad stuff less bad, the other is to eat more of the good stuff, and you do that by changing the way government procures, by introducing long-term legislation, by improving education. So how do we go about doing this, and what are we doing now in terms of uh, trying to get these actions put into place? And I'll just go through a couple of slides very briefly on that. We uh, used, uh, and if you go on to the next slide, there were kind of four major ways in which we were operating. So as I said, uh, this is a meeting, it's an independent review, and so what you're trying to do is create uh, an understanding outside of government, but also make sure that people inside government are, understand the ideas. So the, the way in which we did everything was trying to create massive engagement outside government, engaging with farmers, engaging with citizens, engaging with uh, children. We had a whole um, dialogue, deliberative dialogue process with children, so that as you're creating the strategy, you're getting people not only to give their points of view, because who am I to say what we want of our food system? Why do my values matter more than the rest of the country? But you're also creating, you're educating, getting people to think about it, um, making the soil, the national soil, more fertile to receiving these ideas. And at the same time, inside government, you can't just go off and, and sit in a room and produce a beautiful document. The process has to be all the way through bringing in different groups in government. So we were constantly, we would convene the permanent secretaries of our departments. We were constantly thinking about who's going to have to make the decisions. Do they know what they need to know? Are they informed, sufficiently informed? And so the way in which we communicated involved, again, not just pub pub publishing a report, but raising money to have a website, to make films, to kind of create the narrative and to sell that narrative inside and outside government. The second thing is it is both a manifesto and a plan. And this is in two ways it's both a manifesto and a plan. Firstly, uh, the plan side, in order to gain the authority to speak on these issues, you have to be absolutely clear on the data. You have to have done more analysis than everyone else. You have to know what the truths are, because there are so many false truths out there. And you have to do that work, which, is, uh, which took a, a very dedicated team, pretty much two years to do with some external report. And then you have to put that dry data into a report that is clearly, simply written in pure English that everyone can understand. And so it is both a detailed plan and a manifesto, but it's also a, a plan and a manifesto in another sense, which is we were trying to do two things. We were trying to create a new set of ideas, a new way of talking about the food system that could last for 10, 15 years, a manifesto, but also a plan, specific policies for government, for this government in the UK, which are the right things to do in the next three years. 
So if you're looking at this from a uh, from a, another country's point of view, there'll probably be lots in there on the manifesto side, and you may like to take some of the policy ideas, but they may not be as relevant for your country. The third thing is hustle. So at the moment, the way in which when you produce your report, the way in which kind of ideas and policies get made is that you, you kind of raise the tide, so you convince as many people of the ideas as you can, and you make sure that people understand the data, you make sure that you tackle the false arguments that other people make, you create a, a movement, a spirit, but actually specific policies get made in all sorts of random and abstract ways. So you have to be super attuned to very tactical stuff around when does such and such a meeting happen, is so and so organised, who's, who's coming, who's trying to whisper in the ear of someone to get something done. So you're you're hustling, like kind of entrepreneurial hustle, as well as creating that kind of manifesto. And the final thing I'd say is tone. And if you want to convince both uh, uh, highly libertarian people where that's the ideology, uh, that you actually need government intervention, or you want to explain to someone who doesn't necessarily hasn't spent their life in a commercial world, why, for example, a tax is going to be much more effective than, than restrictions, which might just be very complicated and companies could work round. You need to treat everyone as though they understand, everyone shares the problem and you're working on the solution. And too often in this space, people are cross, angry, uh, um, kind of aggressive, and if you want to get things done, policy done, that is not the way you're going to persuade politicians. There was a song that I love, uh, and the lyrics are on the next thing, which my sister sang at my wedding, which is a divine comedy song. And the, the lyric goes, um, uh, uh, your, your fate doesn't hang on a wrong or right choice. Your fortune depends on the tone of your voice. And every meeting that you go into, every time you're making your arguments, you can be angry about the outcomes. You can be angry about the inequality. You can be angry about the destruction of nature. But you have to realize that everyone you meet um, believes that they are uh, someone who understands the problem and is trying to do the right thing. So I think tone is very, very important. If you want to read more, please go on to um, the National Food Strategy website, nationalfoodstrategy.org. Download it, spread the word. We wrote it so that other people in other countries could spread it, give it to people. Uh, and if you're in this country, finally, I would say, have a look at the actions. If you're an NGO, a campaigner in local government, if you're 80% agreed with the actions or that they're in the right direction, the power of everyone doubling down behind those things, rather than pointing out the areas that they slightly disagree in terms of getting this over the line, these actions will happen or not happen in the next year or so is massive. So please do pile in behind the plan if you think it's 80% the right way to go. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Henry. Um, I think probably the burning question perhaps in the room is, do you think the government's gonna, what do you think the government's going to do? Like, we, we, what's the process from now? You haven't mentioned yet the white paper that's yeah. forthcoming. Perhaps just sketch out how you see that looking over the next 12 months to get people getting a bit of a sense of these, this fantastic set of recommendations. How soon are we going to see them in practice? Well, so it was interesting. One thing I'm often asked by uh, more competitive interviewers is, well, the prime minister, on the first day, those of you out in the UK, the, Boris Johnson, our prime minister, was, uh, was collared and said, what do you think about the tax? He like wasn't, it was a 600 page document. He hadn't read, the, read it. He said, well, I'm not in favor of additional taxes on hardworking people, and who is? But people have taken that, oh, the government doesn't care about it. That's not how government works. So actually, there's a whole government machine that's going on at the moment. There is a white paper where the government's going to respond to the recommendations being published probably in Q1 of next year. And there are all of the departments now being coordinated by number 10 to get their ideas in. Do we agree with these? Which ones do we want to put into place? So I'm actually relatively optimistic. The Prime Minister takes this issue very seriously. I think that uh, Sajid Javed, our new health secretary, understands the issues. Uh, I think that on the environmental side, our Secretary George Eustace understands the issues. So I'm actually, you know, relatively positive that we could see something that is quite groundbreaking internationally in terms of response. Obviously, 
nothing is certain. And it, it, you know, the, these kind of things, you can get something that blows up two weeks before they're about to do something yeah. and it means they, they lose their nerve. But I'm optimistic that most of the kind of signs are showing that we're going in the right direction. So the, be the next sort of big moment really to look out for if you're not in the UK is the white paper. As Henry says, it'll be coming in the first quarter of, of next year, which will set out the sort of next wave of action which, which the government hopes to take, which is a very exciting moment. Um, I wanted to just briefly set the kind of wider context for this event today now, because we've, we've heard a little, well, we've heard in some depth really about the journey that we've gone on here in the UK for the National Food Strategy. Um, but we've got an international audience today and keen to um, think about really um, the relevance of the work in the UK to the work that's going on in other countries. Now, today's event is part of Nutrition for Growth, um, uh, which is a summit happening in the next few days um, in being led by the, the government in Japan, as I'm sure many of you know, and a part of the process. Um, but this comes on the end of um, a series of international events this year, which have really shone a light on food systems. I mean, not least the UN Food Systems Summit, of course, which happened in September, which was a monumentally comprehensive process for really starting a global conversation about food systems and how we need to reorient them to deliver these health and environmental goods that, that Henry's talked about. And then there was a sort of another moment at COP26 in Glasgow when, while food wasn't really on the mainstream agenda, there was a lot of noise about the fact that food is playing such a massive role in in contributing to climate change. So another moment when the sort of food systems narrative developed that much further. And then to, in, the, in the next couple of weeks, of course, Nutrition for Growth, which has a particular focus on nutrition. I was um, involved, luckily enough, to be involved in the very beginning of the process of Nutrition for Growth. Um, I was at the time working for the Department for International Development, the UK government part that um, deals with international aid. And um, we had a different prime minister in, in number 10 Downing Street at the time, David Cameron, and it was, we were hosting the London Olympics in 2012. And he was really keen on trying to create a legacy opportunity for the Olympic Games and was very struck by the evidence, the mounting evidence that um, tackling undernutrition around the world had been quite a neglected area of development that a lot of the energy had gone into famine response and dealing with the kind of acute crises as and when there is arose, but really blind to the fact that poor diets and a heavy burden of infection that children, um, you know, really one in three children in many lo lo very low-income countries were experiencing was having these permanent effects on their health and well-being and on their long-term productivity, long-term life chances as human beings. And... He wanted to do something about that. It led to the UK hosting the first Nutrition for Growth event and then subsequently handing that baton to Brazil and, and now to Japan as subsequent hosts of the Olympics. And so it was a very exciting moment because when it, we, he brought together heads of state, um, we had, I think, 17 heads of state in this huge moment um, in London where we were really trying to align commitments and make pledges to really try and see some substantial reductions in, in, in children's undernutrition. And now, nearly 10 years on, we're talking about this problem in a different way. We're talking about it as the food system. And I think it's interesting to think about how relevant that still is to the challenge and the remaining challenge that we've got of high levels of childhood stunting and wasting around the world, which many people on this call today will be grappling with in, in, different, in different settings. And I think I would argue really that um, along with the investments that need to go into the health system, the food system framing is incredibly helpful for countries thinking about not just undernutrition, as pressing as that challenge is, but also the wave of overweight and obesity which is taking over the world and which Henry's shown is already well established here in the UK and has a knock-on impacts on, on our health system. So Henry, you talked a bit about the, the, the historical perspective. Tell, just 
Tell us that story of what's happened to the UK diets in, you know, since the war. I mean, how that junk food cycle has taken hold. Can you just bring, bring that to life? Yeah, I can, I can talk a bit about the, like, the other economies as well. So in the UK, uh, we move, I mean, there are arguments about when and how it happened. We moved into our cities much earlier than other countries. So in the late 19th century, as part of the Industrial Revolution, we realized that we were we could make more money by bringing the workers into towns to make cloth, sell that abroad, and then buy our food. So by the, before the Second World War, we only produced 30% of our food. I mean, we, we yeah. got our food from Canada and from America. And that then was followed by waves of perfect understandable productizing of food, having things in cans, easy calories, making it cheaper, doing it at scale. In the 70s, we then got the kind of marketing of food, and that kind of carried on. And now, as you say, you know, we eat, I can't remember, we eat thousands of percent more crisps than we do, more sugar, like basically cakes, biscuits, sweets, snacks. We just, they, they completely overwhelm our diet. And it's interesting on the, on the kind of international, it'd be interesting to hear what people here think, but on the international front, I hear people in other countries who've been trying to deal with malnutrition saying that in, in the governing class now, the, the Western problems uh, diabetes is rocketing mm, yeah. and so they're getting that is creating an in so you know someone once described to me as Brazil of being a bit like uh, the economy of Brazil being a bit about 10 years ago but being a bit like India with Belgium in the middle and you have this kind of in those countries both things going mm. on I mean, even in our country in this area of Hackney there's a lot of hidden hunger there's a lot of we're getting problems of rickets and these kind of things coming up where people are eating enough calories but aren't eating enough so I think that it ceased to become an issue where it is one where Nutrition for Growth was, where we need to help developing countries exactly. do better. It's now, how do we change the global food systems? Right, and I think I would argue that um, many of those countries that perhaps haven't gone as far down that track as we have with the sort of hold which the junk food cycle now has on diets, as you say, more than half of our calories here in the UK come from these foods which are very calorie dense and nutrient poor, um, that those countries are perhaps in, a, to some extent, a fortunate position where they haven't perhaps eroded some of those elements which we now recognise as being quite important in making this transition towards a better food system. Things like, um, we've seen from some countries that where they've put in place policies which really protect their national food heritage, their kind of culinary, their cuisine, like nationally. South Korea, Japan. South, exactly. Yeah. They've, they've managed to hold, hold back the junk food yeah. cycle a little bit. There will be other countries where uh, farming um, is largely dominated by small farmers, which perhaps having a smaller impact on the environment where markets are less integrated and there's a closer connection between producers and consumers. Um, a whole set of things which, and where of course vested interests of some of these big food companies are less entrenched and therefore making policy choices to try and curb the junk food cycle might be that much easier than in a situation where the power dynamics are quite difficult to, to navigate in, from, policy, from a yeah. policy perspective. So I think, I think it would be really exciting if we start to see from some low and middle income countries really a route to transitioning faster than perhaps countries like us will be able to do because these things are less, less entrenched and they've got more to build on that's still intact in the system that they've got. And I think that's quite an exciting proposition. Um, I mean, we've been told that, you know, the UK is in one of the few countries that's really trying to think about a strategy that delivers these health and these environmental goals at the same time. Um, but and I really food hope... And food security. So, Absolutely. you know, which is a, at the moment, because of our supply chain issues with COVID, has become Even gone from being important. something we didn't take seriously, <laughs> suddenly something we take very seriously. Yeah, exactly. And many other countries, of course, do as well. So I think it'd be really exciting to start hopefully seeing as a legacy of this year and all the conversations about food systems, some of these, um, it's exciting agenda emerge and some real leadership around the world. Um, I wanted to move on and just ask you one or two questions now about, you talked about the process and you talked about involving citizens. This was something I was really enjoyed as part of the process of working on the national food strategy. 
what difference did it make that we consulted citizens, do you think? I mean, well, so, why was that important? So I think there are a number of ways. Firstly, if you are making recommendations about how you balance, as I said, nutrition, biodiversity, climate, and actually more than that, cultural ways of life in the countryside, the look of our countryside, some of those decisions you can't mathematically determine. So for example, how do we want our countryside to look? There are, you could solve that equation in different ways. And so what, understanding what people value is really important. And that, that was just talking to people, talking through the issues and getting a sense of what they valued was absolutely critical. And it gives, it, it gives the recommendations weight because we also took them through having pulled them together. We took them through focus groups and we brought people back and we really tested them. So that was important. I think the other thing is just the more you engage, like every time you uh, uh, as an individual see a conversation, go and visit a farm or a food bank or a fisherman or whatever, that interaction between data and contact mm. and data and contact is a critical path, a critical part of kind of, I think great policy is made from the combination of anecdote of meeting people and data and checking the two against each other. So I think you know, part of it is about creating great policy, but the other part is about, you know, actually creating policy that people, people want that is then easier to sell to, to government. I mean, for example, on that second piece, the sugar and salt tax, people are actually fed up with the amount of food that's being marketed to them and their children across all demographics and are quite positive in the polling, the focus groups, conversations we've had towards the sugar and salt tax. Meat is a much more contested yeah. area. Yeah. So it became pretty clear to us that we didn't think it would be possible if you had wanted it to put on a meat tax. It would yeah. be regressive, etc. And so we used another solution. We had another set of policies to get people to reduce meat. Now, it may be that those don't work. It may be like sugar tax that over time, yeah. if those don't work and it becomes more acceptable, it's pretty important for the government to know what they can do. Without, you know, governments don't want there to be riots. They don't want to be kicked out of power. And you have to recognize that. So you have to give them policies not only that would work, but that they could put into place. Yeah, and I think this is a really interesting distinction between those diet goals that you set out and, the, as you explained, the interaction of citizens in thinking about their, their ambitions for their diet shift and where they, want to be t where, where they want to be helped on that journey and where they want to be left to make those yeah. choices themselves. Um, so, and, so, but just, and just to add to what you've said, the, the investment in the citizen engagement, it wasn't just the huge amount of actually going up and down the country, visiting people and talking to them and really thinking about policy and how it would play out in that setting with those anecdotes. But it was also a structured, deliberative yes. dialogue process in yeah. five regions. Yeah. So we had, um, what we had wanted to do citizens' assemblies. We got hit by COVID. That wasn't going to work. But we had the same group of 30 people in five regions, demographically selected to represent the population. We got experts to present to them. We got them to talk to each other. We had a number of sessions where we worked through from kind of fleshing out what their views were, what, you know, how they felt about it through to policy. So it was, there's a, there's a real weight behind it. It's not just us going out and having chatting, although there's, it's always good to chat, yeah. you know, <laughs> to as many people as possible, but actually there was a structured process. And then alongside that, we had the structured process with, with the youth, the children as well, and those yeah. came together at the end. So you had the kind of people of voting age, people below voting age, meeting in a final, we had a final day where they spoke to each other and then we kind of took the recommendations out, out from that. Yeah, and I think certainly from my perspective, I really see that as being a vital part of the process and um, what brought the sort of thinking to life from you know, all the data and bringing it into kind of really thinking about how we can make the arguments right for yeah. convincing people. What about um, vested interests, uh, power elite, the people that really, you know, are making money from the system as it currently is? Yeah. And, you know, it's pretty challenging to come up. Some of these policies are not in the interests of some of those existing companies. Um, how did you to explain a bit about how we navigated those vested interests, how we tried to bring people on board that are perhaps harder to bring on board? Well, it was interesting. So we, we wanted originally to, we had an, an advisory panel which had 
CEOs on it from industry. We had some uh, kind of more formal public groups. Uh, so there was a thing called the Food and Drinks Act Council, uh, which is a kind of group of people who talk about the food system. And there was the clarity of the former talking to people individually versus the latter. So the Food and Drinks Act Council quite quickly became a talking shop. They started leaking things and it became a kind of uh, a lobbying body. So you weren't yeah. able to have really a sense. It was very sad, actually. I was, I, I, it was probably just two or three people in there, but it became impossible to have sensible uh, conversations, open conversations about what might work, might, what might not work. But behind the scenes, the CEOs, we talk not just the CEOs who were on the group, we had a, a number of others, they, I think they almost all recognised the problem. Uh, so, and, and, they, and they, they don't want two things. A, they don't want to be the people who are hurting children and others. And B, they think their business is not going to survive if they keep doing it in the future. Mm -hmm. And so I went and spoke recently to a big uh, processed food manufacturer to their strategy day. And I was explaining the junk food cycle. And... I showed them their product development, and basically the last bunch of stuff they'd done was all the stuff they used to do but with chocolate in it. Now, like, that was the last three product launches, and we saw chocolate mayonnaise launched in the UK today. I mean, God, nightmare. Um, so, and they were like, at the end, they said, okay, we didn't believe in the junk food cycle. We now see we are stuck in it. It's not, so how do we get out? Yeah. But then, if you look at the jeopardy for people, the retailers, the supermarkets, it's, they are, it's the easiest, the transition for them, because they're going to be selling our food, whatever happens. And then you have the wholesalers who are kind of okay. But when you get to the processed food people, yeah. it's really difficult for them. Yeah. Not only probably do they have, does there have to be less of that, and they might work out ways of making processed food healthier, but more importantly, they've all got factories that they've built the last 10 years making a lot of this stuff. Mm. So Stranded they're upstairs. in a kind of, exactly. So they're, they're stuck in that cycle. I think psychologically they're stuck in that cycle as well, which is why I think this point about tone is important because I think if you can have the conversations with them where you're beginning to accept the big things and then think about how you can unravel it. So for example, one um, big man of global manufacturer who has a product with a lot of sugar in it wrote us a letter privately saying we think you need to have the, the the sugar tax because if you don't do it i'll just get clobbered by the competition so i can't move unless you do it um and then you know so you see that kind of coming and then another producer said well the sugar tax would work but it's very difficult to see what we do with ice cream because it's, it's hard to reformulate. So you could see privately their minds are beginning to work toward the future. In public, you just get the kind of, you know, yeah. the, nothing to see here, the kind of uh, yeah. the old <laughs> food representatives, it's all personal choice, nothing to see here, move on. That's not, that's not going to last for much longer. That's going to be on the way out, that kind of response, I think. So I think you never see cigarette of, companies doing that the, anymore. Yeah, yeah. So the sort of tips there are, one to one, like one to one, really private conversations with the top brass. I in genuinely companies. trust them. Genuinely going to them, not try to trip them up or tell them they're bad people, yeah. but generally trying to talk them through the data. Um, focusing in on some of those companies that have that broader range of things to see if you can convince them first, because they've got opportunity to move into other product ranges. It's much easier yeah. for them to so yeah. to start with them and avoid perhaps going down the kind of trade industry body where things get a bit reduced to the lobbying line rather than a genuine engagement on how Yeah, I mean, government this. has to deal with trade industry bodies because structurally that's what they're for. But I really think unless they change significantly in this country, it's pretty pointless. Yeah, interesting. So I think we've got some questions coming in. Um, Ros, do you want to read us the first one? Sure. The first question is from Anne Bordier from the World Resources Institute. What type of global frameworks or commitments would enable national governments to accelerate food system change? Global frameworks. Yeah, so I would say uh, that the biggest, um, the biggest problem in the UK, so this is just from a UK perspective, and it may be that there are other frameworks that I don't know about, but internationally, on the health side, we have all the powers to do what we need to be able to do. 
On the environment side, we have all the powers. We are currently in this country taking the common agricultural policy money, paying it for public goods. We actually have pretty much all the tools on a national level. Mm -hmm. The problem is trade. Yeah. So trade is like where the national becomes international. And particularly on the environmental stuff, if we create a, uh, a trade, uh, if we create a kind of perfect system of farming here, but then just import cheaper products produced to lower standards, thereby exporting those environmental harms abroad, it's a kind of, it's a, it's point, the whole thing is pointless. Mm. And I think that uh, I'm urging the government get quite bold on trade, but I think the WTO, which is kind of on its knees, long term there needs to be at the moment that people say oh, leave it to the WTO well at the moment the kind of bodies that do it with the WTO it's by consensus there are so many countries in them nothing is moving so I think that actually the most important thing globally is that I would say is that countries such as the UK do it by themselves begin to put border taxes on forcing other people Force. or the WTO yeah, yeah. to react and thereby saying you can have our we've got a great market and you can have it but you can have it only if you behave yeah. in the ways we want you to behave. And if, if US, unlikely, but if, you know, Europe, Canada, you know, some of the big countries did that, I think that could have a significant impact. So trade is massively important. I'd like to add to that. I think there's also um, the challenge that if, if, you know, this is successful and that, for example, the sugar and salt tax gets introduced in the UK and yeah. we start to... Rest press down on those markets of, for junk food. I mean, that's the intention, is to lead to a point where people are eating less sugar and salt. Um, there's a real risk, and we've seen it with tobacco, that those markets are invested in more heavily in countries where those regulations yeah. don't exist. And of course, um, you know, countries are all on a different stage of thinking about policy intervention in this area. And I th so I think there's also a conversation which would be, or uh, uh, context at the international level which would be useful for thinking about uh, what signals can be sent multilaterally by multiple governments yeah. to companies that are operating in multiple Th markets will be about the direction yeah. of travel and trying to fuel that greater kind of responsibility in this area and not yeah. seeing this sort of balloon effect of squeezing market in the UK and it popping up in I don't know, Nigeria or something. I think the other two, actually, obviously, are really helpful. Sustainable development goals are incredibly helpful because they're agreed to. The other one is COP, which you mentioned. There was very little food at the centre of COP, even yeah. though it was biodiversity and climate, which is like where do biodiversity yeah. and climate happen? They happen in the food system. But all around the outside of COP, there was a lot of food. And I think that someone used the phrase to me in DEFRA, COP to COP. So I think that you establish the tone of the next COP by everything that goes on in between. And I think that for people who are in that space, focusing COP to COP on the food system so that it becomes a central feature of the next COP. Will yeah, be, I completely big, agree. Big completely agree. Any more questions, Roz? Great. We had a question um, submitted previously from Barbara Emanuel at C40 in Canada. She asked, how does your national food strategy integrate with local food policy? Do you want to go so, that? Yeah. so yeah, so there are there are explicitly there are two ways. We spent quite a lot of time thinking about the word local uh, and what it meant, and obviously it means lots of different things in, to lots of different people in lots of different contexts. And there are times where it's important, but then people will say, well, you know, in the UK, for example, it would be stupid to grow your potatoes in Devon because just the soil's not very good for it. We should be sequestering carbon and doing biodiversity and then getting our potatoes from, from the east of the country. Yeah. That would be the sensible thing to do. Or there are some examples where you can actually get, because of the conditions, you can get things lower carbon from abroad rather than from here, our vegetables from the south of England, for example, from the south of Europe. So we tussle with that a lot. And one of the things that we, the kind of the key insight that we had on local is that every example, kind of every plate of food that has ever been a nutritious and delicious plate of food that's been put in front of someone has been cooked locally by someone else. And care is something that happens at a local level. And so a lot of the decisions on when they go wrong on things like purchasing happen when you get pulled too, work too far away from the customer. And so we were strongly in favor of 
local purchasing initiatives like the Southwest Food Hub, which enables smaller uh, producers to sell to bigger organizations. Often you get better quality at as good or lower a price, but they just don't have access. Um, uh, we, we want the government to make it uh, compulsory or make it uh, that all local authorities have to create food plans. And then also we think that a lot of innovation in the food system is done at a very scientific and national level in this country. And there's a lot of social innovation where we think there's an opportunity to prove that by social intervention rather than scientific intervention, you can create change. And so you can actually prove cases where you do social things, such as the prescribing model. Mm -hmm. and, and so there were those kind of ways of, all of those things are ways of pushing the decision and the intervention at a local level rather than being at a global level. You still need some global things. The tax, for example, you have to do yeah, at a national actually, level. Yeah, but lo yeah. local, that local care is a critical Feature. Yeah, and I think probably from many of the countries that um, had signed, people from countries signed up today are in a situation where the markets haven't been as integrated as they are here and where that connection between local producers and consumers is, is already strong, perhaps a lot stronger yeah. than, than here. So again, that might create opportunities for that connection um, and the care that you talked about and the implications for how we eat. It's really interesting. I've talked to three farmers recently, regenerative farmers, so farmers who were uh, using conventional techniques but who were trying to maintain yield but using a less invasive approach, so cover cropping, yeah. min-till, etc., and who've successfully reduced nitrogen by 40%, pesticides, etc. All of them have created... Uh, little uh, horticultural areas on there where they're growing and selling vegetables locally. Right. Doesn't make them any money, d uh, but it kind of felt like because they were thinking about the soil and the farm more. Somehow it made them think about all of the connections more. Yeah. And it was just it's it's really, really interesting. interesting. They've done it. They just like it's done really it off their own back because they, they're kind of. I think the meaning of their life somehow had changed, and therefore they felt that was the right thing. And to I mean, do. that was something we grappled with in the food strategy, wasn't it? Is how we get to this sort of food culture. We know, we know that there are things that are going wrong with food culture in Britain. We know that it's, food is a kind of vital part of how we demonstrate our love for one another, how we care for one another, as you just said. And yet, you know, you don't want government talking about food culture. It feels kind of wrong. Yeah. <laughs> and so how you create an environment where positive food culture can flourish and where food systems do actually allow you to do more of that caring yeah. and more of that loving of each other with food is quite challenging. Yeah, and we set this place up, Chefs and Schools, the charity that I co-founded. We set it up because when I wrote another thing called the School Food Plan for Government way back, and what we noticed was all the schools that were doing it well had a leader or, or normally the head, often with a business manager, who'd said, we need to do it better. It had nothing to do with the structures or the laws. It was about leadership. Mm. And, and then one of the laws that changed was, a, was, as a result of that work, was cookery becoming compulsory for everyone up to the age of 14. But the passing of the law didn't really change very much. So chefs and schools was all about how do you help those leaders, support them, introduce them to other leaders, give them the skills they need, give them ways of working. And that mm. kind of just like... How do you take those leaders and, and supercharge Which them? Brings us to here, right? Yeah. <laughs> one more question, I think, Rose. Um, great question to follow that from Ryan McShane, who is one of our Food Foundation Young Food Ambassadors up at COP um, in Glasgow. Um, does Henry believe that the current UK government doesn't fully recognise the value of our country's youth and that they, that may be currently <laughs> detrimental in speedily delivering some of the recommendations in the National Food Strategy? Does the government and its officials need ongoing regular meetings with our youth? So... On the, sec on the first piece, I would say I just got no idea how to measure how the government, much the government cares about youth, because I'm not sure how you define government, care, or youth. Yeah. So yeah. I don't know how to answer that. But I would say absolutely. So I think, first of all, I think the government uh, does care about the problem, but absolutely more meetings. I mean, I really think... So citizens' assemblies, for example, which were... Uh, 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 were 
in this country viewed quite suspiciously because they were very worried after Brexit that if you created anything that competed with Parliament, so we had a vote in a referendum which had one validity and then a Parliament which had another validity and it caused quite a lot of problems, <laughs> quite a lot of time. And so citizens' assemblies have been seen by some as maybe that creates similar problems. Mm. But I think the reverse is true. If citizens' assemblies can feed into a process, the more you can engage structurally youth citizens and bring them into the process, the better, the better, quicker, Mm. you know, the policy will be created. Yeah, I mean, I've been lucky enough to work in the last few weeks quite a lot with the young people that we work with, including, including Ryan, actually. And I think my massive takeaway from talking to young people about these issues is that they make the connections between issues much more naturally and yeah. freely than we yeah. do. I think as you get older, you get more sort of stuck in your sort of silos and compartmentalising the world and the ease with which you make the connections is is less and I yeah. think that what is really striking when you talk to you they see all of this stuff yeah so, I, so, so the, really the kind of also the kind of patronizing you know things about advertising restrictions when you talk to someone who pulls out that TikTok and shows you look look at this da, 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 and says it it's very different from having you or me. Yeah, totally. And they yeah. think, oh, well, you're just patronising the children. But I so actually, yeah. that direct connection, I was like, oh, my God, it's just so obvious. Yeah, yeah, totally. Uh, one last question, I think. Thanks, Rose. Lovely. We've got a question from Jamie Morrison from the FAO, who's online today. How transferable are the lessons? So I think that, read it and decide, first of all. <laughs> but I think that the central ideas should be, I mean, we talked to a lot of other countries while we were developing this, they should be transferable uh, to most other countries. I mean, it'll be less relevant in less developed countries, but as I said, even those are beginning to have these problems. So, you know, I know that a couple of other government departments have started reading it and using it in their discussions, so please have a look. And then the part, and I think the more we can check, basically what we have, to, the invisibility of nature and the junk food cycle are both true and could both be established on a global level yeah. and it would be a good thing. So that is, a, that is a starting point. And then on the policies, some of them may be, some of them won't be, but have a look. You know, they're there. They've all been really, uh, the, of, the, of, of the book, uh, about, is there a camera on me? So about that much is the, uh, probably about that much is the plan and about that much is detailed appendix with all the data and then there are about three or four other documents to back it up. So do have a look and, and see if you think any of that stuff will be useful in your country. I think I would add to that. I mean, the data is a massively important. It's incredibly rich in the, in the plan. And I think that's a real asset. When we're thinking about transferability, it's a huge asset that we've got in the UK, which not all countries have got that richness of data at their fingertips. And I, so I think if there were funders listening yes. who want to really spur this transition on, invest in making sure that countries have got the right data that they need to inform these kinds yeah. of decisions because it's really important that it's really data-led because that's such a vital part yeah. of the argument, right? Yeah, and one of the things that Patrick Vallance, our chief scientific advisor, uh, put us in the direction of was uh, the work that was being done in sub-Saharan Africa on malnutrition. Oh, yeah, yeah. And he said it all changed when they got data, clear data and maps where they could see the data. Suddenly that issue you were talking about earlier changed. And I think that just explaining the data, portraying the data in itself is a huge deal. I think that would be a fantastic use of NGO, NGO yeah. money. I mean, if you look at what world in data in our country has done in terms it's of incredible. pandemic and stuff, yeah, it really, changes really, minds. Data yeah. changes minds. Good. So I think we've drawn to the end. Thank you, Henry, so much. Um, uh, and thank you all very much for your questions. Um, we'll be obviously circulating the recording of, the, of this event. So if you've got friends or colleagues that you think would benefit from hearing some of the conversation, please do pass it on. And thank you for joining us. Mm -hmm.